gentlemen, if I could ask everybody to grab a seat, please. Continue eating. We've got a packed agenda, so we're going to go ahead and get our program started this afternoon. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Bill Chambers, President and CEO of the Salisbury Area Chamber of Commerce. Welcome to our post-legislative luncheon. If you could all please rise and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Be seated, please. Senator, you can sit anywhere you want. If you want to be antisocial and sit up here, that's fine. Fine by all. <laughs> I want to highlight a few upcoming events that we have as we wind down spring and head towards summer. Restaurant Week kicks off next Thursday. It's a free kickoff party at Rody Joe's at 5 o'clock. There'll be food and uh, all kinds of specials. We have, I think, 17 or 18 restaurants participating this year. Uh, so stop by Rody Joe's, complimentary uh, appetizers. Uh, there'll be a lot of fun there, and all of the restaurants uh, will be present there. We'll, they'll have a chance for a few seconds to talk about their specials during restaurant week here in Salisbury, Wicomico County. We have a really important uh, uh, educational workshop on May 2nd. It's a legislative and regulatory update on issues impacting small businesses and employment practices. It's at the Chamber. It's free for Chamber members. Our business after hours in May is May 2nd. It's at the Civic Center. It is Wicomico County Tourism's uh, our host, and they'll be also giving the Tourism Awards. It's a great event at the Civic Center at 5 o'clock. Uh, our general membership luncheon on May 9th will feature our guest speaker, Anthony Darby from Peninsula Alternative Health. And no, he's not bringing free samples. <laughs> That's at noon at Brew River. Uh, and then May 16th, we hope you'll join us back here at the hotel for the 99th Annual Awards Banquet. We'll have great live music, entertainment, cocktail hours. It'll be a lot of fun. Tickets are going very fast for that. We hope you'll be able to join us. We have some folks visiting with us uh, that attended today. I want to recognize John Cannon, my Comico County Council President. John, thank you. Larry Dodd, Vice President of the Wicomico County Council. Larry. We have all of our legislators with us. They'll be introduced by our moderator shortly. We have former Senator Jim Mathias. Jim. Yeah. Mike Dunn, President and CEO of Greater Salisbury Committee, our partner. Mike and GSC in the chamber, we are, uh, we are partners truly on so many different projects in the area, uh, not the least of which is pushing for continued strong uh, and uh, dedicated investment to public education, and that includes our library, Warwick and our public schools. Uh, Mary Shanti with the Wicomico Chapter NAACP. Mary, thank you for being here. <laughs> Erica Joseph, President and CEO of the Committee Foundation of Eastern Shore. Thank you, Eric. <laughs> Gene Malone, Vice President, Wicomico Board of Education. Gene. <laughs> I know Melanie Purcell, who's the President CEO of Ocean City Chamber, was supposed to be here. She's probably on her way. Uh, Dave Ryan, President and CEO of Salisbury Wicomico Economic Development. Our relatively new library director, Ashley Teagle. I know Ashley was supposed to be here. Don't see her yet. Okay. So, I'm sorry. Uh, Carrie Todd, who's the chair of our uh, Salisbury Area Chamber of Commerce Board of Directors. the Maryland Department of Commerce, Mindy Burgoyne. Mindy, thanks for being here. Appreciate it. <laughs> Our great new president of Salisbury University, Chuck White. Chuck, thank you for being here. <laughs> and Deputy Administrator for Wicomico County Government, Weston Young. Weston, thanks for being here. <laughs> so again, welcome to our April General Membership Luncheon, which is also our post-legislative wrap-up. Uh, I want to draw your attention when you walked in, you saw the signboards. Those are our patron sponsors. 
The patron program is a key component for your chamber that allows the Chamber of Commerce to produce quality, educational, and advocacy programs for our members and the regional business community. I want to especially thank our Diamond patron level sponsors, Pohanga Automotive Group, Comcast Spotlight, Beacon at Salisbury University, the Salisbury Independent, the Maryland and Delaware Group of Long and Foster, D3, and 47 ABC WMDT Television. Today's luncheon, though, would not have been possible without our featured sponsors. Our presenting sponsor for today, again back for the second year, is Associated Builders and Contractors, Chesapeake Shores, uh, Chris Garvey. There's the present CEOs here. Chris, thank you very much for your support. I want to thank our supporting sponsor today, and that's Coastal Association of Realtors. I know Sarah Rain is with us. Sarah, thank you. The kind support from Delmarva Public Radio, and I know Hannah's right in front of us. Thank you, Hannah, for that. We have a short spotlight speaker today, as we do for most of these, and then we'll get right to the meat and potatoes. Our spotlight speaker is Mr. Steve Miller, director of the Wicomico County Parks and Tourism Division. Steve is here to brief us on an exciting and important opportunity for our citizens and their families here in the region. Please welcome Steve. Thank you, Bill, and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Steve Miller. I'm the director of Wicomico County Recreation, Parks, and Tourism. Um, I'm here this morning to talk to you about Challenger Little League and a, a proposed project that we would like to undertake here in Wicomico County. I also want to give you my personal assurance that not one word of this presentation will be redacted. Uh, <laughs> For those, I'm sorry, I could not help myself. Um, for those of you who do not know, uh, Little League is an international organization that consists of three major divisions. Uh, Little League Baseball, which of course we all know, Little League Softball, and Little League Challenger, which is designed for um, students and individuals with physical or mental disabilities. Now before I tell you what it is that we're proposing to do, I'd like to show you just a very short video that will give you a flavor for what Challenger is all about. The Challenger division is a part of our league that allows kids with any sort of disabilities to play baseball. It's a way to bring uh, different factions of the community together. I knew nothing about what the Challenger League was. I got into it because I wanted to make sure that they were playing decent baseball and stuff like that. I stayed because I realized that it's not about the baseball at that level. There's nothing about uniform sizes. There's no one worried about playing time. It's not about which kid is on the mound. It's just pure excitement about the game. I got it. All right. I I am a huge fan of baseball, and because of my uh, disabilities, I wouldn't be able to play like regular baseball. It allows me to meet new people and really show what like I can do. When you're first diagnosed with, uh, with autism, I mean, I don't think we, we imagined him, you know, out there and doing the things that all the other kids do. The way life has been treating him right now and being exposed to these wonderful, beautiful children and these parents, the world is his now. As a parent of a child uh, with special needs, we've come a long way. What was expressed 20 years ago is, is not acceptable. And I think that's because, as a, as a greater community, we're educating our children at younger ages. The most remarkable element of it are the number of kids that volunteer their time as buddies. It's really heartwarming to see these kids come out, give up a precious hour or two of their time. Kids these days have incredibly busy schedules, but yet they come out for two hours every week to act as a buddy. Even though it's like for like the players, the buddies benefit, I think, just as much. You like learn how to be patient with kids, you know how to like talk to them, you know how to like help them out. We have this opportunity to allow kids to be friends first, help each other in baseball, be teammates, and, and that's the reason why they keep coming back. The greatest experience is when someone steps up and pitches and they throw five balls, six balls, and then that kid hits it. You see their eyes light up. It really is the best part of coaching because it's little victories that kids 
don't get in other aspects of their lives that they that you can tell they're feeling uh, great about. Events like this allow us to show that we're part of this community and we care. It's the greatest, greatest thing in the world. Every Sunday we're reminded of what we need in our lives to make us better people. Kids with disabilities don't get to play sports. There just aren't enough opportunities for them. So when we start doing things like Challenger, we're going to have all sorts of players that are enjoying the game and, and loving baseball. If you build something that is being run appropriately, the word spreads. We're experiencing it here in Boston. There are many other Challenger baseball programs out there. There should be one in every single community. As it spreads and grows, it's going to show everyone that our differences are less than we think. This is a kid's game, it's about the kids, it's about teamwork and friendships, and it just feels like what we should have throughout all of the divisions in the league. One, two, three. So that gives you just a real quick flavor of what Challenger is and, and what it's all about. Uh, what I'd like to do just very quickly is tell you about what we're proposing and what we're hoping to do. Uh, what we're proposing is to build a mini ball field at the park. Sorry about that. <laughs> you know my YouTube, ha YouTube habits now, uh, Final Four. Uh, what we're proposing to do is to build a mini ball field at our Henry Parker Sports Complex on Naylor Mill Road uh, that would serve as a home field for the Challenger program for District 8, which covers Wicomico, Worcester, and Somerset counties. Um, I'll show you very quickly an overview of the Parker Sports Complex. Uh, you'll see it here in a second, but what, what we've proposed to do, uh, we've got eight fields at the uh, athletic complex, and what we're trying to do is to build this mini ball field, which would be a home for Challenger, in between field seven and eight, which is why we're calling this project seven and a half. Um, it took a master's degree to figure that out, but between seven and eight. But our goal would be to build the field in such a way that it would accommodate kids with special needs and disabilities. So we would want to do the field with synthetic turf so that the bases would be stitched right onto the field so you don't have a trip hazard for a kid in a walker or a wheelchair. Uh, we would have um, additional amenities that we would want to equip the park with, including uh, inclusive playground equipment, field access, shade for the participants, which is incredibly important. And the end goal in all of this is that field seven and a half would serve as the home field um, for the entire District 8 for Challenger athletes in Wicomico, Worcester, and Somerset County. In doing research in this project, I was surprised to learn that in the three counties, there are 3,000 special needs students um, in the three counties. And there's very, very little in terms of opportunities like this for kids to learn how to play baseball and to participate like other children do. In fact, I found only one Challenger team in the entire area. That's a small team that has been at West Salisbury Little League for a number of years that just play amongst themselves. Uh, unfortunately, the, the heads of West Salisbury were supposed to be here today, but uh, they got called out in an emergency. But their daughter, Brooke, plays. And Brooke was going to join us today, but Brooke plays Challenger. And um, I called the mom, Tina, who's been one of the lead uh, at West Salisbury for a number of years. And we talked about six months ago, and I was telling her about what we were thinking about doing and uh, just the concept and the idea. And she was very, very excited. In fact, at the end of our conversation, she kind of teared up, and I could hear her on the phone. She said, I've been waiting for this phone call for 20 years. And we ended our conversation. With us today is Leo Ayersman. Leo's in the back. If you can stand up, Leo. Leo is the District 8 commissioner that oversees Little League for Wicomico, Worcester, and Somerset County. Uh, Leo's got a daughter, uh, Amanda, 33 years old, with cerebral palsy. He showed me pictures of her earlier today. She's a beautiful, beautiful woman. And he was telling me <clears throat> that Amanda never had the opportunity to play things like Challenger or to get to participate in things like this. And Leo was sharing stories with me about how many kids like Amanda have to drive up to Dover, or go down to Virginia to be able to have opportunities like this. And we believe that shouldn't be the case. Uh, last month, Leo allowed me to go to the District 8 meeting with all the Little League presidents that covers 10 Little Leagues, from Salisbury down to Snow Hill and Pocomo, Princess Anne, and we pitched this idea and all 10 Little Leagues said, we're in. If you build a facility like this, we're going to offer Challenger and send the kids to this facility. Uh, we've spoken with special education coordinators in all three counties and got very enthusiastic support. Dove Point, uh, the YMCA, Special Olympics. And everything we've heard today has been very encouraging that people would like to see Project 7.5 become a reality in our community. Even my own son, and I've 
probably get emotional just telling you about it. We have been talking about this for a while, and my son, I got three boys, 12, 9, and 6, and my 9-year-old came to me um, after a while. We've been talking about it. He said, hey, Dad, I want to be a buddy. I want to participate in something like this. I want to be a buddy to one of these kids. And when he said it, it just it reinforced to me that this, this is the right thing to do. And so basically our goal, we, we often boast that the Parker Complex, uh, our sports complex, is the hub for baseball and softball, and it is that. But with this project, we want this now to be the hub for baseball and softball for everyone uh, in our community and in our region. Now in terms of next steps, uh, our next step is to line up funding. We believe this project would be about a $500,000 project. Our plan right now is to access state funds, a program open space for about 250. We'll be asking the county uh, in this budget to contribute 200. And then our goal is to attempt to raise at least 50,000 or more through private donations. If we can do better than that, even better. We might be able to put lights on the field. We might be able to add additional inclusive playground equipment but the bottom line is if we're going to do this, we want to do it right and we want it to be special. We want these kids to feel proud of their home field. The second step is we want to continue to engage special needs families in the region. Uh, that process has started, but we want to continue that. So in a year from now, if, if this is built and we can launch this program, we'd like families to know so that they can plan to participate and we'll be uh, cultivating that over the next few months. And then lastly, we want to consider additional uses for field seven and a half. Uh, the primary goal, obviously, is what I've just shared with you, is Challenger and inviting these kids to participate. Uh, but they won't play seven days a week, so we want to look at other opportunities. Could we partner with the Board of Education? Could we partner with Dove Point or the YMCA or Special Olympics? Uh, could we do wiffle ball? It's going to be a mini field. You could do local programming. A lot of different things that you could do to be able to program a facility like that, and that will be happening uh, over the next few months. So that is basically a summary of Project 7.5. I want to thank the chamber and especially Bill for giving me this opportunity to share this proposal and this this concept with you. Uh, we're very excited. I also want to thank Chris Bitters. I don't know if Chris is here. Uh, Chris is the guy, if I'm being honest, about nine months ago Chris and I were brainstorming uh, about different ideas and things we could do and Chris is the guy that planted this seed and kind of lit a fire in me and I want to thank Chris for being a part of that. Uh, but this is Project 7.5. We'd love to have your support. I've left business cards on the table, and if you'd like to talk, I'd be available. <laughs> Thank you again for your time. Appreciate it. Thank you, Steve. Um, this is something we got to do, folks. So uh, $50,000 is, uh, is not much for a giving community uh, that we have here. Uh, I urge you to have a conversation with Steve. So uh, let's get to our featured part of today's program. Our forum moderator today is Bill Ferguson. Bill's co-chair of the Chamber's Government and Business Affairs Committee and a member of the Chamber's Executive Committee. And Bill will lead us through Q&A with our legislators. Please welcome Bill. Welcome to all and thank you again to Associated Builders and Contractors. Our representing sponsor and Coastal Association of Realtors for supporting sponsor for today. Let us introduce our esteemed guest. As I had, as I name, uh, announce your name, would you please come up and seat yourself at the panel, Senator Eckler. Addie, please come forward. <laughs> Senator Mary Beth Carosa. Senator, I mean, Delegate Chris Adams. <laughs> Delegate Johnny Maltz. <laughs> Delegate Charles Otto. <laughs> Delegate Carl Anderson. Delegate Cherie Sample Hughes. And finally, Thanks, Delegate Wayne Hartman. I was going to say that. <laughs> the questions for our delegation have been developed by the Chamber's Government and Business Affairs Committee. 
There will be questions for the entire delegation. Each of you will be given one minute to answer. There will be an individual legislator question, and you will have one minute and 30 seconds to answer. And you will have one minute closing at the end of the forum. If time permits, we will take the audience questions. Please write your question down on a three by five card on your table, then hold the card up and a member of the chamber staff will retrieve the card. Now we do have one mic. So the delegation, it has to share. <laughs> <laughs> so the first, we, first question we will have will be a group question. And since Addie has the mic, Addie will be the first to speak and we will go down the way. The State Board of Estimates is projecting upwards of one billion structural budget deficit for the year 2021. Given Kerwin's investment has already begun, what new state revenue streams will you support next year to address this physical situation? Thank you, very, thank you very much, and it was a major a commitment that the legislature, both the Senate and the House and the governor together, working to be able to transform Maryland's education system. Part of the dilemma, I believe, from my perspective, is we had the cart before the horse. We determined what policy was going to be and what specifics within that policy we were going to fund, but we didn't fund it. And so I will not support any new tax increases, either property or income. But what we did do, we passed the taxation of online sales, which is already existing. And if that does deliver the way it is anticipated, that would be maybe about 100 million. I know, know that I'm that optimistic about that. The other uh, aspect of sports betting and um, open, legalization of marijuana, I'm not supportive of, but uh, because I think we need to get things established with medical marijuana first. So sports betting will be on the table. Um, I'm hoping the impact to the counties is not as um, impactful as it looks like it's going to be. Thank you. Next will be Mary Beth. Thank you. Um, Kerwin, so we did the initial, I call it Kerwin Light, um, the blueprint, and as Senator Eckerd noted, we have delayed the hard work, which is working out the funding formulas. Um, all of us, Senator Eckerd, and being on the Senate Budget Taxation Committee, been consistent about talking about, we have to work for fair funding formulas for the shore. Uh, it's why we met with the shore superintendents earlier this session, we asked them specifically for some of their ideas on what those shore recommendations might be because within the three counties, Somerset, Worcester, and Wicomico, um, we have different impacts. So we wouldn't want some of our superintendents proposing a funding formula, and let's say in Worcester, that might end up hurting Wicomico and Somerset. So that's gonna be a big job, and that's the work that is still left to do. As far as future funding sources, again, what, what revenues um, how are we going to pay for this? Um, we have supported, obviously, the lockbox um, to make sure that those funds in that lockbox um, are dedicated to um, education. Um, <laughs> thank you. Um, sports betting. Um, that we should have passed sports betting as a revenue source in 2018. Unfortunately, we did not. So we're going to have to wait to pass that, put that on a referendum probably. Um, I think President Miller was looking at saying you usually do that in the year um, of an election uh, when you put that on the referendum, but that should be a source of funding that other states are moving ahead of us um, in identifying as a source for public ed. So um, we need to try to stay on time. Issues. So if you could please. So, so on, on the question, I just want to reinforce the point that uh, next year we're expecting a one billion dollar uh, budget shortfall. Uh, we have in the rainy day fund $1.3 billion. So we are looking to next year having a very significant, difficult conversation. We frankly knew this going in. I voted against the budget. I voted against the BRFA. Um, I frankly voted against Kerwin because I felt as though we weren't listening to the realities of the time. We're expecting a recession uh, sometime in the middle part of next year. Uh, Moody's has made that 
a sort of prediction. I know they're general predictions, but the point is that we're talking about trying to create new revenue streams for next year. We should have talked about how we needed to keep spending in line this year when we, when we were able to control it. So on Kerwin, let me just say to you that uh, the one thing that Kerwin had to do was help resolve formula-based spending, uh, make that work this year. Instead, they passed the buck till next year when we have this $1 billion shortfall. I believe that Kerwin Commission is not going to be able to deliver on the needs of the, uh, the formula-based changes because of what we did in legislature this year. So we've got some real issues coming forward. Uh, real quickly, yeah, the online sales tax, I don't support legalizing marijuana, but yeah, we'll take the money. I will support the sports betting. I will not support new taxes. And getting to Kerwin, I just wanted to make sure everybody understands this. That funding formula is a big deal. Wacomico, Dorchester, Caroline, Somerset received 7.7, 3.7, 3.6, 1.9, respectively. Very good. I support that. The problem comes in if you look at, uh, if, if you look at, let me see if I can read my own letter. If you, if you look at what Kent, Worcester, and Talbot received, they received 310, 688, and 665,000 in, in contrast. That's not sufficient for those counties, and I've got a big concern about that. So, uh, I voted against the blueprint for education, and I think it's a tragedy that uh, Dr. Kerwin could not come up with something better after four years of study that's going to give more responsibility and uh, accountability to some of the education programs. I think there was common ground with uh, uh, pre-kindergarten that uh, there would have been money found for that and things like that, but just to open a blank checkbook for salaries uh, and a system to get the same mediocrity is a, is a problem with me. And uh, Addie and uh, Mary Beth outlined many of the uh, new revenue streams that are possible. We had a $700 million, uh, billion, million dollar uh, windfall last year with the federal tax changes. So that's all been gone out the window. So uh, with that, I'll end. <laughs> Good afternoon. Uh, sure. So, with regards to the We're current commission, that is um, uh, a bill that I did support. Mm -hmm. Yes, I well, do know be. that it is okay. requiring uh, additional uh, vetting because we need to make sure that the state um, and the local shares of what they're, what that pans out to be and what that looks like is very important that we naturally know that. But we also know that out of this commission came uh, $2 million that's going to be set aside to ensure that mental health service coordinator is going to be available in the school system. If we can't say today um, that we don't need those type of services and many others, including the school construction and many other proponents of this piece of uh, legislation, then I don't know if I guess you're, you're, a, you're locked away in a box somewhere because these pieces in this piece of legislation are very important. They're important to the growth and the future of our school system. And so to that end, yes, I did support it and I will continue to work to figure out how we can continue to fund it, um, but I still am not in favor of new taxes. Um, I'll stop there. Thank you. I, um, to start off with Kerwin, I did support the Kerwin uh, bill. There are parts of it that I unfortunately can't pick and choose. I, I think we do need to do more to enhance the teacher salaries and um, do more for recruiting. Um, there are parts of it I didn't like. Oversight was a big concern for me. Oversight was taken out um, as far as oversight and the amount of, of spending that's that taken place. But there was, um, at the end, um, there was a, a level of oversight there that, that I was comfortable with. As far as um, funding, you know, there, there are certainly so the, the original budget, I, I didn't support. I voted for the budget when it came back from the two committees because it eliminated some of the spending and saved for a rainy day in light of the, um, the deficit that we're expecting next year. Um, as far as uh, I wish an option was for, for where we can cut as opposed to where we can increase new revenue sources, sports betting I, is something I could um, support. It. Medical marijuana is something um, that I can't, and um, I'm being cut off here. So. So yes, of course, uh, serving on the appropriation. First off, how y'all doing? Good. <laughs> it's good to see you all. Y'all look so good. It's been a long winter. It's so good to be home. So yes, uh, serving on the appropriations committee, uh, you know, we, we understand that, you know, there's a shortfall projected every year uh, in long range planning, if you look at it. And, uh, but we'll find a way to overcome. I will not support new taxes. I think we've dug in our pockets enough. I will support selective revenue enhancements. People want to bet on sports, knock yourself out. If you want to tax marijuana, whatever. 
you know, put it on the referendum and let everybody else decide. That's how I feel about it. That's just my personal opinion. But uh, we need to fund education, of course. Beaver Run Elementary School, Mardella Middle School. We need school enhancements in Del Mar and Fruitland as well. Those things are in Kerwin. So, you know, uh, we're going to overcome. We're very resilient people. I say that all the time because I believe in us. And so no matter what comes our way, we're going to achieve and overcome. And anything that we can do in Annapolis to help better Wicomico County, we got to do it. There's just no other option. Please project the House leadership will look like next session, mm -hmm. giving the Always recent passing of Senator of, of Speaker Bush. <laughs> what impact can a radical change in leadership have on issues that directly affect the Eastern Shore? <laughs> well, I think I'll have some extra time here, so I'll finish up on the last question. I might represent Worcester White Comico. The funding mechanism from Kerwin, having to vote on something and not knowing to what benefit it was actually going to help our constituents was the hardest part for me. I wish the when funding formula tell. would have been set prior to um, this year. They're promising that by December of this year. Moving on to this question, though, as far as the leadership in the House, you know, um, I, I'm not here to for a, a partisan or bipartisan conversation, but I think we need a two-party system in Maryland. And, and I think what we need to do when we do select the new speaker is the Republican caucus leverage votes. I, I, if we go for the top leading Democrat um, content, you know, where they don't need our support, meaning the Republican party, um, I, I don't think we're gonna have our voice heard. I wanna see the Republican caucus leverage their votes with someone else who's maybe two or two or three down the wrong that needs the Republican caucus's votes to get elected, knows that they need us and listens to us, and we have a voice in Annapolis. So I, I hope it's a big change for conservative, um, for a more conservative Maryland. Thank you. Okay, delegate Hughes. Thank you. So what I will say, first and foremost, so, um, Speaker Bush, he certainly set the tone in my belief that um, leadership speaks volumes and he has always been an individual who was always willing to listen to anybody regardless of the party um, his door was always open so when i see us moving forward in the state and needing to cast my vote on may the first it's going to be from someone who is fair firm but also looking forward towards a positive future and that's what we need uh, we need that because that's what's gonna propel us forward, regardless of, of who you may uh, select as our next speaker. But what I will um, share is that, you know, we have tough issues in the state of Maryland. Um, uh, healthcare is a huge issue, education is, is huge, um, but we also know that it's important that we uh, come to the floor with the voices of the people that we represent. And so we gotta have somebody in that position that who wants to listen to our people who will come and visit our legislative districts and be that voice for the state of Maryland. So I'm you know, looking forward to moving this forward on May the 1st, praying that we have a fair, firm, and fair person. Delegate Aldo. Uh, thank you. Delegate Sample Hughes. Uh, it's a difficult question that's not answered yet of who the next speaker will be. I think we have three leading candidates, uh, all of them all three of them have strong character and uh, integrity, I believe. Uh, some have different philosophical leanings, and the whole committee structure is up for grabs. Uh, the speaker sets the committees, assigns the committees, so many of the committee chairmen, uh, their future is uh, in limbo right now, and uh, I, I would find it difficult to tell you, if, after we know who the speaker is and some of the assignments that are made, uh, I think we could have a better idea of what our prediction could be of, of what legislation would move forward and what would uh, stand back. I think it is still a challenge for us on some environmental issues and uh, with agriculture and natural resource protection. Uh, I mean, there's a lot of potential there for some radical sides to get uh, uh, more control, and I don't believe that would be fortunate for the citizens of Maryland. Delegate Anderson. Yes, yeah, so uh, Speaker Bush was always good uh, to all of us, to me especially. Anytime I needed anything, he always came through. Uh, if you spend time at uh, Shorebird Stadium this summer, if you go down Main Street in Salisbury, if you see the amphitheater there, if you go to a lacrosse or a football game at SU, that turf field, all those things, he had his fingerprints on because I came to him uh, just as a regular person, not as a Republican or as a Democrat or as Western Shore or whatever. So 
Replacing him is going to be tough, but we have three great candidates. I have great relationships with all three. One of them is a personal friend of mine. Uh, the other two is a committee chair and a subcommittee chair that over this exact same time period I've worked with very well. In fact, this year, the $307,775 for the Entrepreneurship Center located in downtown Salisbury came by two candidates uh, for the speakership who helped me with that. So I fully believe that no matter who is holding the gavel, that uh, we will do just fine when it comes to budgetary measures and things that we ask for for the Lower Shore in Wicomico County. Delegate Maltz. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and just, just to follow up on that, you know, um, losing Speaker Bush was a, um, uh, um, a super, su such a somber uh, uh, occurrence. And, um, you know, he wasn't doing well. He was still running the chamber. And you could see his body kind of failing. And, uh, you know, he and I, we didn't agree. I didn't vote with him very often, especially on the controversial bills. But like Delegate Anderton said, you know, anytime I needed something, or even when I was doing something wrong, he would grab me and say, Johnny, you may want to argue it this way, because you're not making a whole lot of sense that way. You know? <laughs> he, he knew he had the votes, but he just wanted to help you. He wanted to help you succeed. Um, and so, so, you know, we're, we're going to miss him. And um, there are three candidates. Who knows? Maybe there'll be more. These are crazy things. They're not structured. They're always surprises. But I think the, the projection is I don't suspect too much is going to change. You know, we had the election. The composition of the legislature has changed. We're dealing with that right now. Whoever goes in and whoever comes in with them, it's going to be on us as the shore delegation and we work closely on this to bring them over here and keep them up to speed on our issues i broke my broke the time sorry delegate adams i considered uh, speaker bush a coach uh, and a friend who i often had wide disagreements with which is okay in annapolis we are politicians we represent our, our districts uh, he put me on economic matters committee which is a committee as a freshman uh, was a gift a frank a gift for someone that that would have been the one committee where i could make a, a difference in my community I will endorse uh, Delegate Sheree Sample Hughes's comments in full. Uh, we need someone who's going to give a voice and listen to the Eastern Shore, have a seat at the table. To that end, I will share with you that the Republican uh, caucus met uh, in executive session, and it's a matter of public record, but we made a binding uh, vote to support a candidate as a group. And that's important leverage that I hope that we're going to be able to use because I believe Republicans drive the same conversations and concerns that Delegate Sample Hughes raised. The fact that we can even have a voice and a chance to make a decision on this is historical. And I believe that the Republicans will be effective in having this conversation move forward. And May 1st is going to come quickly. God bless our speaker and God bless the state of Maryland. Senator Carrozzi. Thank you. And uh, I also echo the comments about Speaker Bush. But I also want to say that what's important for the group here is the consequences of the election and the composition of the new Maryland General Assembly and what that means for us uh, in the Eastern Shore delegation. Um, so it's not only a leadership issue, it's also a composition issue. And so whoever the next speaker is, and, and certainly um, with President Miller's leadership, we as an Eastern Shore delegation are under more pressure now to make sure that our voices are heard because it is a more liberal-leaning, urban del delegates and that have come in, uh, 43 new delegates, 17 new state senators, new committee chairs and vice chairs. Our job here is to make sure that we educate and build relationships, bipartisan coalitions, that the leadership understands so your voice is heard when these policies and regulations come down. We will be able to work with whoever that next speaker is because we will build those partnerships. Senator Eckhart. Thank you very much. I probably served with uh, Mike Bush longer than anybody else. It's been 25 years um, since, and I worked with him all those 25 years. It's been kind of exciting to have had two terms in the House Economic Matters Committee under his leadership when Cass Taylor was speaker. Mike Bush is fair, he's measured, he's organized, and he's very clear and he saw potential in all of us. And I'm just hopeful that the three people who are candidates right now that I'm aware of um, have exercised leadership. I have watched them in action. And it's going to be kind of a toss up to me. But I also would agree, I think we in the Senate are probably watching what happens in the House very closely because of uh, President Miller's illness. 
and we have a lot of new players, new committee chairs, but I agree with Delegate Anderton, we are very resilient in Annapolis, and I think there's a lot of optimism in how it will go, and that we will have a voice with whoever is the new speaker. Thank you. The next questions will be individual questions. The first one will go to Delegate Chris Andrews, Chris Adams. Chris Anderton, there's a one. There you go. Yeah. Chris, <laughs> looks good on you, boy. <laughs> Chris Anderton. Look good on you. That's right. I need that shirt. <laughs> I got you. The healthcare industry is in crisis with huge rate increases and now just one real available option and the Affordable Care Act is in jeopardy. One viable option is to help deal with accessibility and affordability issues is to make more small group options available via associate association health plans. Given the likelihood of that, that the recent federal court ruling on AHPs will be sustained or overturned by another judge, what is your position on permitting organizations like Chambers of Commerce's, the option of other health care insurance plans, to their members, most of them are small businesses that currently offer no coverage or just catastrophic policy coverage to their employees. All right, well, thank you for the question. I'm a business owner. We have 36 uh, employees at the moment. Uh, we do, do offer health care coverage. Um, I'm also a member of a cooperative, a national a buying group of sorts. And there are many states that allow our members in this cooperative to join together in a very large national cooperative to buy health insurance for the purpose of saving money to spread risk, spread costs. So I immediately understand the reason why and the rationale behind having groups get involved. Chambers of Commerce are excellent groups because it doesn't require a significant investment for a business owner to participate and be part of the Chamber of Commerce. On the other hand, being a part of a cooperative like we are was a very expensive proposition for which we continue to pay to be part of that membership. So when we can take these Chamber of Commerce's and deliver cost savings by driving costs through a broader audience, you do it. The problem is the state of Maryland works against that almost out of its basis with how we pay for health care. And it is an open conversation as to how we're ultimately going to get uh, to the point of lower uh, cost for our citizens. Right now my uh, premiums and deductibles are sky high for my workers, my employees that participate. It's almost to the point where it's catastrophic coverage. That's what it ends up being. And so this is not working and delivering for the business community. We are a great resource. We have the financial capability to de deliver fringe benefits, allow chambers of commerce is to do the right thing for their members and for our citizens and in the most efficient, cost-effective manner. I strongly support uh, creating these plans. Thank you. You're welcome. Next question is for Senator Carosa. Maryland is home to some of the wealthiest jurisdictions in the United States, Montgomery and Howard County, to name two. Maryland is also the home of one of the poorest jurisdictions, Somerset County. More than one in four Somerset County citizens live in poverty, the largest share in Maryland. It also remains a racially segregated county. During this first term as state senator, what are your top three priorities and positively impact Somerset County in ways that are economically diverse and inclusive? Thank you, um, and I appreciate that question. I am very humbled um, to represent Somerset County, and I have made it a priority, um, not only on the campaign trail, but during my first session. The three top projects that I've been working on in Somerset County with partners at every level both at the local level and at the state level with Governor Hogan's administration in a bipartisan way is number one, to maintain a health care facility in Somerset County. We have a, a proposed affiliation between PRMC and McCready and it's absolutely essential that we lock in that agreement and go forward. Number two would be the, we need to work on our critical infrastructure. I have been working uh, with the administration, Governor Hogan's administration with UMES and with um, ECI on the Chesapeake Energy natural gas line that comes through. We need that ga natural gas line uh, for the infrastructure for our residents there, but also to um, promote economic development. And finally, the third area is Chris Field's infrastructure and revitalization. 
And again, what is good for Crisfield is good for the whole region. And we just had Secretary Holt down this week. Um, he committed on behalf of the Hogan administration to move forward with their significant sewer infrastructure challenges. And we also have a commitment to work on other revitalization projects in Crisfield. So those have been the three top areas in Somerset County. There's a whole lot more going on. We had the Lieutenant Governor at UMES yesterday. We have other projects going on, but that's been the immediate focus. Thank you. Next question is for Delegate Hartman. <laughs> Continued increase, increased state funding to Baltimore means resources are going somewhere else in Maryland. But you agree, but I think you would agree that Baltimore's success is tied to that of the entire state. When committing funding resources, what degree of responsibility do you believe the General Assembly has in trying to address the multitude of issues Baltimore is facing? Well, I think we're only as strong as our weakest link, and you know there's a lot that needs to be done. Uh, a bill that comes to mind that we had this session was to um, to allow Johns Hopkins University, the largest employer in Maryland, they uh, desperately wanted their own police force. And um, that was a, a, a big bill to allow them to have it. I think they wanted to um, add 100 um, police officers, certified police officers. The, se the crazy part is there was resistance um, from folks around Johns Hopkins and some of the, um, the delegation from Baltimore City. There's, with some of the, the problems that have been in Baltimore regarding the police, there's some resistance to more police. Um, so the downside to us, that bill had over the next four years, $50 million of additional spending to create programs and grant, um, different different things in, in Baltimore. So next year with the passing of that bill came 10 to quarter million from, from state funds, 10 to quarter million the next year, then goes up to 15 million for the following two years. So there there is an expense with it. The um, the disheartening part for me, it's, you know, whether we think it's right or not, we certainly don't have the numbers to change that. So if, if there is gonna be, you know, any level of spending, um, the, the numbers are certainly in Central Maryland uh, to support that. So, um, you know, when I see common sense, so, some of the big things when we think about Baltimore, we think of the gun crime and things of that nature. And when there's resistance to common sense um, gun crimes and, and things that would, would help Baltimore in the state as far as its, their perception, and they're resistant, you know, uh, penalties for theft of guns and, and, and different things, um, and they're, they're resisted, it's kind of disheartening. The Baltimore City Police Department's under consent decree, they're talking seven to 10 years to fix those problems. We all saw what happened in Baltimore City with the, you know, the allegations of the mayor. So it, if it is gonna be fixed, it's, a long, it's gonna be a long process, um, but there, there will be you know, our money being spent to do that. So I don't think we, uh, we can stop that. Thank you, Hart, uh, Delegate Hartman. Next question is for Dele Delegate Otto. Senate Bill 542, Community Healthy Air Act. The intent of this bill was, to, was an attempt to establish a link between poultry house emissions and respiratory health, particularly in minority communities. The bill not, did not make it out of committee this year, but its sponsors vow to bring it back next year. If the concern is human health, why are these bill sponsors opposed to statewide air emission testing? not just around poultry houses. What will you do to fight this bill when it returns to next year's General Assembly session? Delegate Alden. Well, I hope we maybe it won't, but uh, this is the third year we had that bill, and it's basically pushed by anti-chicken people out of Washington, D.C., an organization called Food and Water Watch that many of our good friends from Montgomery County uh, have contributions and responsibilities to push forward some of their efforts. And I understand where they're coming from. But the fact of the matter is, there is air quality monitoring in the state, and the red code areas are a lot Baltimore City. And the biggest part of that is coming from the Willibrator Trash Incinerator uh, program there. So uh, uh, we have things going on. As a matter of fact, there's a meeting next week on April the 25th at the University of Maryland Eastern Shore at the Henson Center from 7 to 9 with the partnership between the Delmarva Poultry Industry, 
the Department of uh, Environment, and the Campbell Foundation, uh, a real environmental organization that uh, put forth some of the money to create these additional monitoring stations and modify some of the existing ones that MBE operates to get some data. Uh, and uh, the industry is not afraid of the data. There's going to be particulate matter coming out of chicken houses, but it doesn't go far, so we have tree buffers and things like that. And manure stinks. <laughs> so, <laughs> with that, thank you. <laughs> Next question is for Delegate Hughes. And after she has her one minute and 30 seconds, I would like Delegate Anderson for a comment. Anderson. Uh, sure. Anderson. Tom. Close enough. Carl, Carl Adams. <laughs> Carl Adams. <laughs> Delegate Hughes. Oh, you got the question. And there goes the poster. What's the question? Huh? Right. There you oh, go. Okay. <laughs> 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 who's on first? He's got, you don't know who's Sheree, who's on first? Lycomico so. County is facing a septic crisis. Yeah. Septic systems are failing at accelerated rates. Exceedingly wet weather conditions are delaying septic work, and a comprehensive review of the Wicomico County Health Department by the state of Maryland is slowing the septic permit approval process to the point where real estate deals are seriously delayed or falling through completely. What can be done at the state level to ensure property owners in Wicomico County stop hitting these damaging septic roadblocks? Thank you for the question. Um, so I look at it on a multi-pronged approach. Uh, number one, at the local level, we need to still continue to have those conversations with the Coastal Realtors Association to understand the fullness of the issue. Uh, while we are out of session, this is the best time to have those conversations and get the full uh, vetting of the issue and, and truly understand it. Then I look to the fact that we need to address the efficiencies. There are inefficiencies in our, some of our state agencies. And I found that recently uh, when I was dealing with a city citizen who, um, after recent flooding issue happened, right in uh, his driveway, right on Route 50, his whole road collapsed right there in his yard. So we have real flooding issues, we have septic issues, and all of these things need to be dealt with, but it needs to be not done in isolation. It needs to be done holistically and collectively because everybody is facing these issues. And so to that end, um, that's one area I would work to make these efficiencies a little bit more improved. But also we have the Maryland Association of Counties, which is a collective voice of all of our counties, because it's just not happening in Wicomico County for the septic being the issues. It's happening in other parts of the Eastern Shore and we again collectively can speak with uh, our colleagues but also uh, Mako has a very strong voice um, in Annapolis. As a matter of fact it moves a lot of legislation in the Environment and Transportation Committee and my committee Health and Government Operations. Um, so it is an issue that needs to be vetted consistently but it needs to be done in a systematic process so we can improve efficiencies but also fully understand the issue holistically as well. Delegate Anderson. Comment. Ditto. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Comment. Di absolutely, ditto. But uh, you know, we need to follow uh, follow up with the county council, the county executive, to see what we're what they're hearing firsthand. The Coastal Association, of course, absolutely. Uh, but we've secured a couple wins here and there. Working with Senator Mathias over the past five years, dealing with septic issues on a person by person basis uh, throughout the county, and uh, you know, legislation was put in. To, to alter the way septics were, were installed, the type of septics that, that would be installed. The governor uh, repealed some owner's regulations that allowed it to be easier, but now we're still facing roadblocks. And so I think taking direction from the county council, going up through the Maryland Department of the Environment, uh, there's no reason why we can't continue and expand some of the small successes that we've had recently uh, working with this particular issue and of course the flooding issue is not going to go away it looks like we're turning into more Seattle and less uh, Texas so you know we might as well get used to the rain and learn to adapt so that's what we'll do thank you last question for the individual ones is for delegate malt oh, yeah. <laughs> I think I know what it is <laughs> I bet you don't uh oh uh oh you ready? I hope you asked the one I'm thinking of. <laughs> <laughs> we talk about oysters? 
No. <laughs> There's not one on. Yes. Cross that one off. Oh. During the 2019 legislative session, the General Assembly overrode Governor Hogan's veto of the $15 per hour minimum wage. In the legislation, companies with 15 or more employees must pay workers at least $15 an hour by 2025. And companies with fewer than 15 employees must have until July 2026 to comply with the law. You voted, you voted for five separate amendments to the bill that failed, voted against the bill, and then voted to sustain the veto. Please explain why you voted that way you did, and what are your concerns with the legislations as we go into the future? There's actually a joke in this question, because I sit in the Prince George's County delegation, I sit right around them, and then when the controversial bills come up, I'm usually voting red and they're usually voting green. And they're always tapping me on, come on, Johnny, join the winning team. Vote with us. You can win for <laughs> once. <laughs> yes, the uh, $15 minimum wage uh, increase bill came through our committee, the Economic Matters Committee. And, uh, and I, I opposed the bill in committee, and I opposed the bill on the floor, and I supported several amendments to the bill. Uh, the base of it, I'm deeply concerned about the impact of mandating that $15 minimum wage on our economy here on the Eastern Shore. I think the situation may be different in other places around the state, but for us and from the economic information that we receive through the hearings and the debate, it's clear to me that it's going to put a, a, a hardship on our economy unlike others, specifically the small businesses. They are going to really feel the brunt of this. With 15 minutes, 30 seconds left, okay. So I'll some surmise there was, a, there was an amendment uh, steer, speared pretty much out of Ocean City to come up with a tiered minimum wage as they do in some other states. That was rejected. The idea is we'd have one minimum wage for the shore, another for the more populated areas. More populated areas are able to generate more revenue, therefore they can keep up with those costs. We on the shore, we don't have that population. Another proposal was to reduce the minimum wage to $12, which follows that tiered approach. Um, in essence, uh, I'll close real quickly, that the minimum wage is supposed to target poverty. Poverty is driven by a number of factors. Wage, wage earnings is not the top factor, uh, and, and, and poverty is a serious issue, but I oppose this legislation. As you are aware, Wicomico County is slated to receive nearly $1 million, 10% of the state's allocation were earmarked for the conversion of the Poplar Hill pre-release facility into an opioid treatment and drug rehabilitation clinic. Sadly, the county was not able to secure a contract provider to manage the facility, and the funding is now lost for this year. Given your experience in the healthcare industry, what steps will you take to secure this funding in next year's state budget? And what can you do to assist the county and its elected leaders in securing a contract provider for Popular Hill? Thank you very much. Uh, that's, a, that's an issue near and dear to my heart because I had several pieces of legislation this year that would allow psych nurse practitioners to be able to do not only telehealth in our substance use and mental health clinics, but also act in the role of the medical director and use telehealth. First of all, I want to say recovery is possible and denial is very real. It will not be easy to establish any kind of a treatment center anywhere on the shore or anywhere else because nobody wants it in my backyard. And I would suggest that I will be glad to go to the mat and do whatever once we have a very broad-based community effort, community network, a clear plan for an RFP, and a clear direction with our providers who will provide it, and a good program. Because we can't do decent drug detox and treatment without, I believe, 18 months plus. And then you're gonna have to have aftercare, it needs to have work, it needs to have training, it needs to be very comprehensive. You all have a facility that's capable of doing that. But it's gonna take a broad-based effort and some real 
soul searching and working together to make that happen. So my charge is to you all in the chamber and Greater Salisbury Committee and all of your different organizations, you have a great program right here, Resource and Recovery Center. Build on what you have. Uh, your health officer was one of my nurses. She knows substance use and abuse and psych real well. Put those people to work and get them to provide for you and we will deliver it. Thank you. Let's have closing comments and we will start with Senator Eckhart. Yep. One minute. <laughs> One minute. Yeah, thank you very much. I work on infrastructure all the time, so I work on everything from soup to nuts. We were able to do an interesting pull the properties, the, pro uh, the abandoned and blighted properties off of the tax sale that you all probably implement down here in Salisbury before anybody else will, to be able to turn those properties and get them back into homes for people. That's really, really important, and we need to change the system. I will continue to work on the delivery of psych and mental health services and I'm on a couple of task forces and commissions to do that because we don't have adequate care. And it encompasses when we do our health care, and I want to say a word about association plans. It's a great idea, but we have a delivery system in Maryland that's going to be hard to change. It's like the three-tiered liquor system. And we were able to work on that, make those changes, but it's gonna take everybody working together because we do have small group. We want it affordable. We have large group, they want it affordable. And we have health choice. We have expanded Medicaid and then we have um, a like a small group that's rolled into health choice that, that everybody can get access to care now. And that's really important because we don't want anybody to be left behind. Thank you. Senator Carosa. Thank you all. I want to uh, thank the Chamber of Commerce and I want to thank ABC and our other sponsors, Associated Builders and Contractors, for bringing us together. I think it's important that you hear these updates. A lot of us go through and really prepare and want to give you good information, so I did bring copies of my end of session letter, which has a lot more detail and I'm not limited to um, 30 seconds. But I, I just want to make the point that um, my committee assignment is good for the shore and I want to leverage that committee assignment. It's, Senate, it's the Senate Education um, Healthcare Environment. <laughs> And that's important for the, for the shore. We're building like some bipartisan uh, coalitions on that committee as well. Um, I think you also should know that we need to continue to work together on our partnerships. And what, what I was really excited about is how many of you came up during session. And one project that I think we can all work together on as a delegation is our new healthcare approach. Um, you know, I know a lot of you have been briefed on it, the PRMC, SU, UMES. This is a, a project that the delegation can get behind. We can work with the Hogan administration. We can work with our colleagues, bipartisan way, um, in both chambers. So it's something I'm looking forward to. I want to continue to work with you. Need your feedback. Thank you. Thank you. Delegate Adams. Uh, first off, Bill Chambers and the Salisbury Chamber of Commerce, thank you for the opportunity to be here today as a business owner. It's always wonderful to stand in front of a group of other like-minded folks. Uh, and, and let me just say, as I'm standing here, uh, you also have a wide, uh, diverse group of like-minded folks that represent you here in Annapolis. And it is a, a proud moment to stand amongst all of us here and, and share our values. Because in Annapolis, uh, it is very difficult for us on the shore to make sure that we're getting our voice heard, to make sure we have a seat at the table. We have in this delegation uh, wide viewpoints, but almost always, well over 90% of the time, we agree in principle on almost everything that happens in Annapolis. For those remaining 10%, we have respectful uh, debate and criticism that helps move the process forward. So uh, with a conclusion, I would just simply say to you that uh, you have a group here that works very well for you, works very hard. I hope you sense that uh, through today, and uh, we appreciate the opportunity to be here today. So thank you. Thank you, Delegate Malt. Uh, yeah, just um, in closing, I just want to uh, say, t tell everybody, thank you very much for all the support that you've given us, and I also want to thank all my colleagues. You know, our delegation, we work really closely together, and this session, this past session, was unlike the last four. And uh, it was controversial. We, uh, our delegation spent more time arguing, I think, probably than any other delegation in the House chamber about different bills. And um, a lot of those debates were very serious. The bills were controversial. And, um, and I want to make sure everyone understands that when we're voting, when we're voting a certain way and when we're arguing a certain way, we're not necessarily trying to kill a bill. We're trying to make a concept better. 
changes on the way. I mean, the speaker's changing, the legislature changed, and a lot is happening right now. And so we're going to be very busy this summer, next year, and the following years. And we're going to continue to need your support. I just want to make sure everyone knows that no matter how we vote, we're participating in a constructive manner to try to make the best policy for our communities. So thank you. Thank you. Delegate Anderson. Yeah, sorry. I thought that was going down. There you go. All right. <laughs> okay. Well, thanks for letting me come hang out with y'all today. It's always good to be, like I said, back home. Uh, you know, being away for you know three and a half months uh, up in the Annapolis Fish Bowl was is fun for like the first week, and then after that, you know, it's not as fun. Uh, I miss y'all a lot. So every time somebody comes up, it's almost like you know somebody from my mom or dad coming up. You know. Uh, Mom, I, I don't mean that. I mean, you, you're still my girl. But when people come up from home, you know, it's, uh, it's good to see familiar faces. You got to take care of mom. But uh, being on the Appropriations Committee, you know, working on uh, seeing how the state budget works and working with the committee chairs on securing funding for SU uh, to, to make sure that empty building on the plaza is not empty uh, was awesome experience. As we go forward next year, looking for a much bigger project, dealing with the health uh, collaborative between SU, UMES, and uh, the University of the University of Maryland, Baltimore, uh, one of those schools up there. Uh, I met the president up there and told him he was my guy, so he's in. Uh, but it's just a really interesting opportunity to make new connections and build new relationships to make sure that everything that we need here on the Lower Shore that we're able to get. So thank you so much for the opportunity to work for you in Annapolis. I mean it. Thank you. Thank you. Can I get all of Thank you. I just want to encourage all of you to participate in this organization. At, this was my ninth regular session in the legislature, and I saw more from the state organization, from Maryland Chamber of Commerce, during this session than any session before. Because oftentimes I thought they were AWOL. But the chamber is important, and your participation, and it's only as good as your membership and the activities that you do and knowledge that you relate to your members. And I encourage everybody to take care of that, as well as the realtors and the ABC, uh, all of that is very important, and your input is very important to us because we don't always have our focus. The radar scope is thin. I mean, we know a lot of the, most of the subject matter come before our committee, but there's other things that we can do on, on that's on other committees that is very important that you keep us informed on. I thank you. Thank you. Delegate Hughes. Thank you, and uh, thank you all for being here today. Certainly, um, always is a pleasure to come back to the or come back home and to feel certainly welcomed and um, the eagerness of all to learn what has gone on in the session. So uh, I believe that this session was very aggressive and was quite progressive, um, quite different from others, but certainly I was up to the task and thankfully was able to come back with some wins. What I will share with you is that um, the speaker did put me in as the chair of the opioid work group. Mm -hmm. So that was another level of leadership and another level of responsibility, but we got some good things out of that work group. One in particular was the opioid restitution fund. This is a mechanism to ensure that funds will be available to support behavior health and opioid issues as they come forward. So all the lawsuits that their attorney general will be working on, the funds will directly go there and so we can have a long term uh, a mechanism for funding. So to that end, I thought that was very positive. We also, um, the I serve on the health care committee, we dealt with um, enrolling uninsured persons through a faster process. Can I take his last 10 seconds? <laughs> <laughs> because now, okay, because now on your state uh, tax form, there's a checkbox where you can check if you need insurance. So that's going to be an easier way to get 50,000 people estimated mm -hmm. to get back and do their insurance. And then lastly, I was able to bring home some funds through our bond bill project. I saw very else from now I get an elevator. Woohoo! So um, to that end, I'm very thankful to and humbled to continue to serve. So thank you. That was too fast. Thank you. <laughs> Delegate Hartman. Not as long as we thank you. I want to thank the chamber, everyone here, ABC, uh, Coastal Association of Realtors. And uh, I want to thank those who, if uh, any of the voters out here that supported me, I want to thank them. I truly enjoyed my first session up there. Um, going from council to uh, delegate, it's so much more broad and encompasses so many more things, hospitals, universities. It's just amazing. It totally encompasses you the time you get there, the time you leave from morning till night. And, and I work well under those um, situations. I like, I like being busy. Um, Johnny Motz mentioned something about the um, 
charitable minimum wage being an Ocean City thing. It was an Ocean City thing. I worked with Worcester and Wicomico County, took leaders up there, got a meeting with the speaker. And um, it, you know, no disrespect to the speaker when I was talking earlier about leveraging Republican votes to be heard. It's also nice to be listened to. The speaker gave us time, listened to us, and uh, you know, very respectful. But at the same time, um, you know, what we talked about didn't necessarily work. The bill went through. Um, so I had um, Bob Culver up there with me, Charles Wright from the Farm Bureau. So it was a, an effort between Worcester and Wicomico. I've rushed through all my other answers. I'm going to steal another minute from you if you don't mind. Um, <laughs> some people have asked questions about the 14 and under employees, 15 and over employees. That wasn't addressed in the minimum wage bill. Talking to DLR, what, what I think they're going to do is take the average number of employees you had the year before, so however many employees you had each month, they're going to average that out, and that's how you're going to determine if you're 14 or fewer employees or 15 or greater, in case anyone falls in that boat. Three years, we need to work different. Um, I, I truly believe in the two-party system. I don't like radical right-left. Um, I, I think um, we have redistricting coming in 2020. <laughs> Your arms are going to get tired of having another 30 seconds. Um, <laughs> we have redistricting in 2020. Hopefully that's going to help. And, um, you know, as a business owner, you know, I have concerns as to what I was seeing up there with minimum wage being pushed through. Um, we hear socialism on federal We're level. I see things happening in the state. We have a, a built-in budget deficit, but yet there are bills that are being passed up there with mandated spending. You know, so we're bringing up the bottom, taking off the top. Um, I think that covers everything. I have a newsletter I sent to Bill Chambers. Hopefully he'll share it with all the membership. And um, thank you again. So, Can we have a round of applause for our George Buzzer's going to come back. Yeah. Bring it back, girl. Please join your fellow business and organizational leaders right here on May 16th for the 19th Annual Awards Gala, Music, Cocktails, Dinner Remarks from the Maryland Chamber of Commerce CEO Christine Ross and a celebration of this year's award winners. Todd and Jackie Carlin, anchors of WBOC-TV, will be our masters of ceremony for the evening. Thank you for attending. Mm -hmm.